keeps growing. <laughs> Great. All right, everybody. Well, it's a blessing to be together and we'll, we'll bless it by, uh, we'll bless it by blessing, um, sharing in the, the blessing for learning and kind of, um, you know, really becoming hungry to, to learn. Um, in some ways, this is the kind of hors d'oeuvre or um, table setting, um, this blessing that kind of, um, you know, shifts our gear to, to express that hunger to learn. Um, so here we go. Baruch Ata Adonai, Elohinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kishanu Bermitzvata, Mitzivanu La Sopri Brei Torah. Great. Oh, they're, they're pouring in. You were right, John. They were waiting. <laughs> um, good. Well, this is, our, um, this is our midpoint. Hi, Debbie. So great to see you. Um, really glad you're here. Uh, Janine wanted to mention she's not going to be able to come tonight, but she sends her good wishes to everybody. And um, hi, Philip. Great to see you. Shalom, shalom, shalom alechem is, is what we say when we greet each other. I'll put that in the chat. It's kind of a fun um, little secret handshake. You say, say shalom alechem, which is um, peace be upon you. And the response is, does anybody know? Alechem alam. Oh, very close, Alechem Shalom. You say it backwards. Um, um, upon you is peace. Um, yeah, so, so this is our midpoint um, in, our, in our learning together. And I just wanted to kind of articulate where we've been and where we're, where we're going. Um, our first class was about Shabbat and really the the how to um, how to roll out this weekly uh, rhythm and gear shift in our in our hearts and in our homes, um, looking at some of the the reasons why um, we do Shabbat and how we do Shabbat, and then our last class uh, was about brachot, about blessings and the scope of this um, kind of uh, inculcated instinct to, um, to acknowledge and point to source um, before we act and really to kind of pause time uh, in order to um, become present to the sanctity of of the moment and what we're about to do. And, um, and, and tonight we're gonna look at kind of one of those blessings, um, particularly the, the blessings within the mezuzah. And you'll hear me do that accent a little bit, like the, the emphasis on the end is more of the he Hebrew, um, traditional Hebrew expression and mezuzah is a little bit more um, just colloquial, you know, are you Diaspora. going? Yeah, more of the English, you know, English and Americanized version of, um, of the Hebrew, like Hanukkah versus Hanukkah um, would be another example, or challah versus challah. Um, they both work, but you can hear kind of the the Hebrew um, is done di differently with, you know, more kind of refinement. Um, but they both, again, totally work, totally wonderful. I just don't want to confuse anyone. Um, so I just wanted to pause. The, the question um, I asked at the end of last or last class was, is there a blessing that anybody wants to write or try out? Um, in their lives. And I wanted to just come back to that and see if anyone had, has been working that muscle of um, the sacred pause. 
it's okay if you know not but i just wanted to follow up i missed that last class but i've been really trying to come up with one for when i take um, any of my medications and and supplements or herbs or the things i take for my wellness because it, it's an active choice to maintain my wellness that i'm doing it and i want to sing if i want to make a kadosh yeah beautiful and I remember Jade, you asked that, and a lot of um, folks will do um, bore mine bisamim um, for herbs and medicines and um, kind of things like that. I'll put it in the chat. So that's um, the one we do at Havdala. Mm -hmm. ha Havdala. <laughs> yeah. Bore um, mine bisamim. And Debbie asked, what is kadosh, which is sanctified or distinct or holy? Um, yeah, thank you for that great question. This um, meme over the variety. I see your hand just a sec, Phil. I just wanna write this um, variety of spices or smells. Some people do it when they, um, yeah, any sort of. Um, some of them taste really bad. Some of them are not fun or beautiful or wonderful. And it's like, oh, I got to take that. Yeah. You no, know, it's, it's, I thought the spices thing was this was you're blessing that because that smell is making up for the loss of Shabbat because it's so wonderful. Yes. And these are things that, Oops, you know, some of them might even have side effects I don't appreciate, but yeah. I'm taking them because of the main effects. Yes. That yeah. still fits? Yeah, yeah. And we talked about that last week of um, we are not always blessing the good or the beautiful or the perfect. Um, there are specific blessings for um, uh, ugly creatures, ugly people. I mean, all these things we could talk a lot about and we did um, a little bit last time. But um, yeah, I would say it's just over the um, the variety of, of spices and yeah, so it works. Philip, I see you had your hand. Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't done any work on it this week, but one of the blessings that I'm, that I'm really interested in is basic, and I'm interested in it because I want to eventually, uh, both figure out the Hebrew and the English and set it to music is a simple gratitude for existence. I am here. I'm alive. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I know where I know sort of where it comes from. It comes from the one that has uh, Sechianu in it. Mm -hmm. Shehekianu, yeah. Shehekianu, yeah. Very good. Uh, but I want to leave that out. I just want the opening and the uh, the very last phrase. Mm -hmm. What's the last phrase? Basman Haza. Yes. In this moment, anyway, yeah. I haven't done any work on it this week. Um, there's a great artist uh, who is one of my teachers, beloved Rabbi, uh, Rabbi David Zeller, who has some beautiful albums. And um, one of his songs is called Chai Ani, which is I Am Alive. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you might, you might like that. It's a really wonderful one. Okay. Anybody else want to? Um, tag in on, on the blessing. Uh, I will, Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, a favorite of mine is, ever since I read your book, Modiani is mm -hmm. Modiani. I love to say that uh, upon awakening. It, it's one of those that uh, is kind of at the margins. It's a prayer, but it's also a blessing. Yeah. And uh, on the last page of your book, you mentioned that it is a prayer, but also that it's, you don't say it's a blessing, but that we, on the same page, we have blessings for everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to me, they're, they're kind of the same. Yeah, yeah, anyway, I just absolutely. love that one. Thanks, John. You're, you're my publicist in, a, in your spare time. I'm so grateful. <laughs> or truly, it's like, you blow me away. Um, yeah. Um, and and on my on my website, I mentioned last week. There's I describe a little bit the difference between prayer and blessing, um, but you're right. There is um, 
usually, you know, a very quick hand um, distinction is blessings start with Baruch, um, whereas prayers often don't. Um, so that's just a quick uh, shorthand. So along those lines, let's go ahead and look um, at the handout. I don't know, I'm going to put it also in the chat here in case you all want it here. Um, is everybody getting the emails that I send out um, just on Wednesday? It's a one email of, okay, good. I see your. Um, does it have, does it have a printout in it? Yeah, it's the PDF um, that I also just put in the chat. Um, I so don't know if I'm getting that. Okay. Um, you can email Jody. She might not have you on the list. Um, but then we, we, paid something for this class right we signed when we signed up mm -hmm. yeah i don't think i'm getting that so okay um i thought that she was gone now or was it just her goodbye and she's still physically there and when nina's, did we switch? nina's retiring or nina's oh nina leaving. i'm confusing people sorry that's yeah, right yeah um i'll also try to remember to look jage as well you can email me if it's easier um and i'll look but um great okay so let's kind of um dive in to this conversation about mezuzot. And um, I brought I brought one of my favorite mezuzot. Uh, it says l'chaim on it. Uh, it's just a clay, simple clay. Um, this is called the bait, which means the house. And um, the mezuzah is, literally means the doorpost. And historically, just before we get into the handout, it would be that um, people would just chisel um, a hole or a little kind of um, scoop out within the lentil of their doorpost and rest in there a tiny, what's called a cloth. So I know I'm doing a lot of Hebrew, but um, a cloth is um, the scroll itself, the inner scroll, like the within within this bite, within this house, you put inside one of the ends, you, you um, scroll, scroll up a scroll. I don't know if that's grammatically acceptable, but um, anyway, you get the idea. And um, I wanted to just show you because it's mentioned a few times in the handout, what the cloth looks like. So this is um, a cloth. Can you all see the Hebrew? Yes, this is a gorgeous one. Um, and we could just spend the whole night just talking about um, the text and the meaning, but I'll just give a quick kind of overview of it because it's, to me, it's, it's really fascinating to know what the the heck is in there. <laughs> um, that's really the whole point. So this is, um, it's a piece of parchment, animal skin, and it's written in the same uh, formality as a Torah scroll itself, meaning um, a sofer, a scribe, uh, has to be specifically trained as um, in the arts of um, scribal, inscribal arts. Um, it's not just calligraphy, it's an entire really lifestyle um, of um, mindfulness and awareness and ritual, both preparation um, before, during, and after the, um, the writing of any piece of uh, holy text. And what you see these tiny ridges are the um, and I don't I don't know the lingo honestly, but what you can you can just see that each um, letter hangs from that tiny ridge. Those are like almost imagine like a lined piece of paper, um, and what you're seeing here is two paragraphs. Um, two main paragraphs, and then the Shema itself. So this is the Shema on the top, the, the first six words um, from Deuteronomy. And you'll notice that the Ayin and the Dalid is enlarged. Barry, you'll love 
you'll love this, I think. Um, and you, I imagine, know it, um, but I'll just share it with everybody that the iron, well, do you want to share it? Do you want to teach it? What is unique about the eye? Well, the, the only thing I know about it is that it means witness. Exactly. So the iron, this letter, this kind of um, scoopy, scooped out letter, and this uh, top thick letter, if you put those two together, they spell the word aid, kind of like in English, the transliteration would be A-I-D, and that means um, witness. And so, you know, there's lots of thoughtfulness around who's witnessing who, are uh, we witnessing ourselves, is God witnessing us, are we witnessing each other? And this is the way it is done in the Sefer Torah, in the Torah itself. Um, every Torah has certain um, scribal, like indicators, I would say, that are consistent across, um, across the text. So the sofer or soferet, there are many women, well, not many, but a growing number of uh, female um, identified scribes, um, and they copy exactly from the Torah itself. One of the texts that we're gonna hopefully get to tonight speaks a lot about what is on the last line of a mezuzah. And there's a question of whether or not, um, basically, the, in terms of justification, justification um, whether this al ha'aretz upon the earth should um, should be right justified or uh, almost left justified. Does that make sense? I know I just said a lot of things, but there's just like so much to jam in. Um, these would at you, the would, would, Rabbi, yeah. would you say that last part again? Right sure. justified and, and less justified and what that's referring to? Yeah, so I don't think I can highlight a picture. Oops, no. So these, I'll just, can you see my little arrow? The little arrow pointer? Yeah? So this, these two yes. words on the bottom line, it's a question of whether they should be right justified or left justified. That's the, the debate. And one of the conversation is about, um, which I'd never actually studied that text before. I found it really beautiful. Um, this word right here um, is hashamayim meaning of the heavens. And the question is um, whether or not al ha'aretz, whether upon the earth should be, should be below the heavens or not. Are you getting this? It's a, it's, a, it's a mystical conversation, but also a very practical one of, um, and, and what you, I guess what we can glean from even the question or the conversation is the, this um, scrupulousness of, that's a fun word I haven't even said in years, <laughs> the scrupulousness of, um, of attention to the detail, not just of the lettering and of the, the scribes um, technique and um, ritual readiness, but even the, even essentially the white space, in addition to the black ink. And this is a, this is a very big mystical um, a conversation that um, it's often said that the Torah is it written in um, black fire on white fire which is, you know, mind blowing and awesome. And, you know, I just, yeah, so cool. Um, so this is what's in a, a mezuzah. And we're gonna look at the text itself, but I also just wanna mention while we see it here in this big chunk, um, this is also the text that is 
divvied up inside of the tefillin, inside of the uh, phylacteries, the, the wrap on um, prayer boxes that you might've seen before. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing screen so I can see you all and just make sure and see if anyone has questions just so far. Yeah, Barry. Uh, <clears throat> I understood al haharats um, should it be right justified or left justified? And the word before it is upon the heavens and upon the earth, but I didn't understand uh, the connection. Heavens above and earth below. Um, so literally, if, if, if it's right justified, the heavens would be over here and the earth would be over here versus if they're not, they would be on top of each other. Okay. And what's the arguments for each one? Well, let's, let's look at the text together. I just wanted you to see what on earth they're even talking oh. about. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because it's, it's kind of obscure. Um, so yeah, let's look at that. Um, just any other questions about the text itself or the scribe or um, there's a wonderful scribe. I'm just going to put her name, uh, Julie Seltzer, who's um, so ferret in San Francisco um, and has written um, many, uh, many Sifre Torah and did an incredible um, exhibit at the San Francisco Jewish Museum. Um, and she's got some great videos and it's wonderful. Yeah, Jage. Do they have them for sale at, at TBI? I've got the mezuzah bait, but I don't have a, a scroll to put in it. Yeah, there are Clefim, um, the scrolls in the bookstore. Yeah, and there are different sizes. Um, and there's like kosher scrolls and unkosher scrolls. Um, often when you buy mezuzah, especially in just like a, a store where they might not be specifically a Judaica store. Um, they'll just give you a photocopied, um, a photocopy of that section of text. And that's not considered a kosher scroll. A kosher scroll um, is follows a lot, follows the, the rules that I laid out and is relatively expensive, to be honest. Um, can be, you know, I would say upwards of $30 for sure. Um, and some are hundreds of dollars, depending on the, the scribe who wrote it. And, um, you know, the, the crowns, that was the other thing I was gonna mention, the crowns um, um, on the top of the lettering and all of that. Yeah, and just as an FYI, it takes a sofer, soferit, um, traditionally about a year, like one year to write an entire Torah. Um, Debbie, I see, yeah, if and when the ink blots or, yeah, it's a great question. So they, because the, the DAF, the document is so small, they would most likely just start again. If it's on a, um, a parchment, a, um, a column, that's what they're called within the Torah itself, sometimes depending on the degree of the blotch they can scrape off or there's a lot of um you know like remedies but it depends on the sever severity it also depends on um what word has been um you know mushed up and what letter has been mushed up and on and on but one of the one of the reasons why the columns are not so big is because of that if they need to um, start again you know they can without um, you know doing it on if they've already done three columns on one piece of parchment you're just you know in in deep trouble and sadness so it's a big it's a very um very disciplined it's almost you know probably i don't know but like japanese calligraphy and all of these you know ancient scrabble arts um very very important and precious 
So let's look, yeah, that's a great question. Let's look at the rituals um, and, and just to say, you know, these four classes that we're doing here are really to, to, bring, um, to bring Judaism into our homes. And the mezuzah is the, the threshold of really, um, you know, it's, it's obvious, but it's really the threshold between us um, our intimate home and the rest of the world. And um, we'll look at that in a second, but here's the source that describes um, um, in Devarim, um, al that you shall literally uh, write them upon the doorposts of your house. And this is that word, mezuzot, is literally, that means doorposts. And um, oops, um, that's why people would either carve a niche in the post, in the right, the top one's called the lentil, right? In the, they would carve a, a niche in the post, or um, I've also seen it where people would write little, literally the Shema on the actual doorposts. They would, you know, like imagine your door frame, they would write it on the doorposts because that's what the commandment is. The commandment has nothing to do with make sure there's a pretty box for it to go into. That's what's called uh, hidur. Let me just put that in the um, chat. So hidur is the concept of beautifying um, the mitzvah, and it can be any mitzvah. That's why, you know, candlesticks, they can literally be two matches, or they can be, you know, hand dipped, you know, happy bee, whatever candles. Um, so hidor is very much, uh, we are, we love a good hidor opportunity um, as Jews and especially Jewish gift stores. <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they do it. But you can see the variety of, um, and this is, you know, two mezuzot out of all of them. But this is, um, this is the text itself from Deuteronomy uh, 6, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And this is what we just looked at, where it's the Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. That's those first six magic words. And then it goes, um, uh, you know, take these instructions and, and, and make for yourself kind of post-it notes around your house. And the mezuzah is our kind of holy post-it notes. Um, so here we see the two verses here, um, you know, teach them when you rise up, when you lay down. Um, and then this is the verse about tefillin, of wrapping yourself in, in this paragraph, bind them as a sign um, upon your hand and upon your forehead. Those are the two boxes. And then inscribe them, uchtavtem al mezuzot, inscribe them on the doorposts of your house. Um, and then there's a, uh, I found this text, maybe if it's, um, does one of you wanna read this text from Blue Greenberg? We've looked at, I think some of her work before. She wrote a book called um, how, how to Run a Traditional Jewish Household, which is an incredible book. Um, she's the Rebbitzin to uh, Rabbi, Yitz Greenberg. Somebody want to read this? I'll read it. A Jewish household is created by the people who live in it, by the way they act, the things they do and don't do, and the beliefs they hold. A mezuzah, a mezuzah serves two functions. Every time you enter or leave, the mezuzah reminds you that you have a covenant with God. 
Second, the mezuzah serves as a symbol to everyone else that this particular dwelling is constituted as a Jewish household operating by a special set of rules, rituals, and beliefs. That was great, Jage. Very pro. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's inward focused, you know, for those of us inside, and it's outward focused. And it's really that, um, again, that threshold, that liminal indicator of, for, for both parties, and, you know, the third party, I would say, is, is God, you know, it, and this, I add that because, you know, in Pesach, they, they would literally paint their doorposts with blood. And that was to, so that God would pass over their houses. That was the original mezuzah. Am I going too fast? I feel like I'm kind of a little bit on fire with this topic. <laughs> I just, I just think that's a really good example of a description of Kadosh with the mezuzah, the, the mm. separateness that happens. Yeah. That. Absolutely. Yeah, Jage, that's great. Yeah. And, and again, this is where you and, and Debbie were speaking about the word Kadosh. Um, Kadosh is, it's, you know, people often say it's holy, but it's distinct and separate. Um, and it can also be something about time. It doesn't have to be time, but it can be like Shabbat is Kadosh because that day always connects us to God. God set up a loophole in the universe that whenever seven days rolls around, we land back at Kadosh. Mm -hmm. I love that description. Beautiful. The loophole in the universe. Where, who said that, Jade? That's gorgeous. Is that you? Well, I kind of, I, I, I invented that out of, I've been studying Kabbalah a lot lately. And I invented yeah. that out of the Kabbalah lessons. And Kabbalah, we do things like the Shabbat candles or the mezuzah, because those things, um, our intention when we do them, uh, creates the, I'm going to use my own word here, the wormhole that lets God into the planet to do things in our lives and our world. Yeah, yeah. And that's, um, so again, coming back, you know, Philip to the question between um, Hashemayim and Haaretz, the heavens and the earth, what, what we're, what we're describing here with this idea of the mezuzah is the heavens and the earth, the kind of um, the cosmic and the, the everyday the um, the public and the private, the the inner and the outer. So it's it becomes this kind of metaphor for the thing itself. <laughs> what's what? Tell me more about your facial <laughs> arrangement. <laughs> I, I you'd have to repeat that. It just went over my head. Yeah, let me think about. You know, like um, a lock and a key. It's like, um, it's a lock and a key. And it's also so many more metaphors. If you could look at it at the dark side and you have to invite a vampire in, it's like inviting God in. But that's the opposite. You know, that's a... <laughs> that was wild. I don't know about vampires, but I... Um, but yeah, the letting in, for sure, that we... You know, and, and so the mezuzah is almost like a... a um, doorbell you know for god or a lock and a key like push this come in and it's um let's look at the text because it actually um that's both what jade just read um 
So, yeah, so um, every time you enter or leave the mezuzah, you know, you press that doorbell and literally people um, reach up and kiss, kiss the mezuzah as kind of to ring that doorbell for themselves. And then of course, as people, you know, drive by or come into a Jewish home, they, they see that doorbell as well. That it's, you know, it's a special doorknob for, or doorbell for, for Jews and for God. Right, because it's not just your own mezuzah, everybody's mezuzah you do coming and going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Is there one outside TBI? Oh, yeah, on all the doors. I guess I just never saw it. I wasn't looking. Yeah. Does somebody want to read um, this text? This is a bit, um, it's surprisingly um, mystical, even though it's, from the the laws of mezuzot debbie do you want to read it sure great mishnah mishnah torah mm -hmm. tefillin mezuzah and the torah scroll 613 people must be very careful about the mitzvah of mezuzah because it is an obligation on everyone at all times so that any time they go out or come in, they will brush against the unity of the name of the Holy Blessed One and remember God's love and wake up from their sleep and errors in the daily life and know that there is nothing that lasts forever except the knowledge of the Rock of Ages. And they will then immediately return to their true knowledge and walk on the right path. Yeah, so this is, um, I just love this image. They will brush against the unity of the name. Um, and literally there's, you. that's why you touch it. You, you, and you kiss it. You make contact with uh, the unity of God's, you know, of, of God's connection or, oneness and 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 return to their true knowledge and walk on the right path it, there's kind of an underlying theme here of for each of the classes that we're doing about how do you walk jewishly how do you live jewishly there's so much um doing in judaism People often think, oh, it's all, you know, do you believe or don't you believe? Judaism is mostly about action. And these rituals are the, the, the kind of, um, the, mo the, the mode or the, the how to walk. So let's look a little bit more, if it's okay, I'm gonna bypass. I, I figure you all can answer the questions on your own. Does that sound all right, if you'd like? Okay, love the giant lines. It's like very freeing. Um, so um, yeah, so this is the text, um, Barry, that I was mentioning and um, that's kind of fascinating. So um, I don't know, does anybody else see a little funkiness in the line there? It's a little weird. Let me just, how do I? Yeah, it's like a bad photocopy. Yeah, let me just try to reopen it. Let me just close that item and then reopen. Bad photocopy. <laughs> Okay, let's try it. It's opening again. Okay, let's see how this does. This. Okay, a little better. Great. Um, 
Thank you for your patience. Um, okay. um, so this is in the Talmud, um, a conversation between uh, Rabbi Zeri, or Zeri, uh, and Rav uh, Hananel. Um, and they're both, their, their quote, well, it's really a, a chain. Rav Zeri says that Rav Hananel says that Rav says, and Rav is a major figure in the Talmud um, who's kind of adjudicating has a lot of weight. So what does Rav say? And I'll just, I'll just read this one because I think it'll, you'll be able to kind of digest it a little bit easier. Um, that a mezuzah that one wrote two by two i.e. two words on each line is fit, is kosher. And this is referring to um, those two lines. I'll just pull it up real quick again so you can, is referring to these two words. First of all, that the two, these two words have to be together on the same line. And so that's one issue. Right, you can't you can't separate upon from the earth. They have to be together. Does that make sense? Okay. Then it's about the placement of them. Um, right, justified or left justified, and Hebrew, of course, um, starts from the right and goes left, which is interesting to me because if you know because that's the case it's weird to me that they're even having this conversation because it would imply that there would be this giant space before. So anyway. And there's nothing else artsy about how it's written. I could see if other parts of it were written to be poetic, but there's nothing else poetic about the right. I guess the giant ein and the giant dalid. So it would begin and end with something poetic, but it is odd. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll look up and study the text a little bit more, but I just want to offer the disclaimer that I have. Uh, um, so let's just um, read this through. So Rav Hista, so this is kind of one opinion, writes or says that one writes the last two words of the mezuzah al Haaretz, meaning above the earth, by themselves on the final line without the preceding word. The preceding word being hashamayim. Oh, that's interesting. So Rav Chista says that it's just al haaretz on that last line and not hashamayim. I think I get it now. So it's not a question of right justify or less justified. It's whether the word before is part of that. Is this too obscure for people? It's a little obscure, right? <laughs> Yeah, Debbie's like over it. Okay, <laughs> now I'm with you. It is a little, so we'll just breathe through, breeze through for a second. The sages disagreed as to how this was done. Some say that one writes this phrase at the end of the final line, and some say that it writes at the beginning of the final line. And then the Gemara explains their dispute, right? So the commentary in the Talmud explains that the one who says that one writes it at the end of the final line interprets the verse that your days be multiplied and the days of your children upon the earth, which the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as the days of the heaven above the earth. Meaning that if you do it one way, let's just forget the right or left. If you do them all together, you are basically creating a hyperlink to this lovely verse where that phrase is all together. And then they quote a second verse where that phrase heaven and earth is together. And there are a million heaven and earths as you can imagine. Consequently, if one writes above the earth at the end of the final line, it will be below the term the heaven at the end of the previous line. So if you basically, if you don't have the three all together, you could break them and have 
the heavens be on top of the earth. And the one who says that one writes it at the beginning of the final line explains the phrase as the days, so quotes a different verse, does a hyperlink to a, a different verse. Consequently, if one writes above the earth, um, separate from the heaven, um, it is far from the term heaven. So this is just to say, and I'm gonna take this off because probably your brain is like a little dizzy. Um, they, our tradition loves the details, loves the details of um, especially textual details. I mean, we are, we're not just the people of the book, but we are the people obsessed with the, the ink, the type of paper, the, you know, the, everything about the book we are obsessed with. We find, and obsessed, we find meaning and magic and mystery and, um, and it keeps us coming back um, to strengthen our relationship with what's in the book. It would be like, you know how when you go out to a good ref restaurant and everybody talks about the meal? <laughs> it's like this meta experience of what you're doing. And then you get home and you're still talking about the meal and you tell your friends, that's like the goal. Is like you're so immersed that you want to keep playing with it and that it becomes part of you. Philip. Uh, when you talk about the reverence for the book, uh, I, I take it that that, that that means the Torah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to apply the same way to the in, in, in entire Tanakh, the entire Jewish Bible. There seems to be a difference in how much reverence is paid. And I, I'm curious, it, it, can you talk about that distinction a little bit? Sure. I mean, that's a giant question, but I think you're, you're picking up on um, something that is very true. I mean, the, the five books of Moses has a distinct um, and paramount sanctity. Um, and really everything builds on that. Um, the Zohar is written based on verses from the Torah the Gemara, you know, is, is a commentary on the interpretations, the legal and um, story interpretations found in the Torah. And then the, the writings and the prophets, the two other parts of the Tanakh that, Barry, that um, Philip's mentioning do have a different place. Um, they're not, uh, they're not as, they're not primary, um, but they are secondary. Um, which constitutes them as part of the Tanakh versus, um, you know, other writings that didn't, didn't make the cut, which there are oodles of, but for sure it's like Torah, prophets, and writings. That's the, the pecking order. And those two, you know, Torah, we read we weekly and half Torah and, and prophets, we read as part of the Hof Torah, we also read weekly. And you see that um, kind of allegiance paid in that way. So you're, you are correct. Rabbi, is that, is the Shemash, is that be, it's, it's only the five books of Moses. Uh, why is it separated out as a teaching book and not, uh, why doesn't everybody just use a Tanakh? Yeah, it's a cool question. Um, I I think it's kind of a the Tanakh is is you know bigger, takes up more room, and just like Philip is saying, often you just need the humash. Um, so I'm just putting in the chat. Um, the parts that 
Um, so the Humash um, is the five books of Moses because it's Chamesh, Echad, Shtayim, Shalosh, Arba, Chamesh. And the Tanakh is a, an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, and Kituvim, Torah, Prophets, and Writing. If I had a white bird, you can, you know, I'd do one going down and one going across, but you get it. Yeah, cool questions, everybody. I really, um, I love that you're staying kind of more in the micro, but you're also connecting it back to the macro, which is very cool. Um, and, and along those lines, right, the, the Talmud isn't even part of that. The, the list that you, isn't part of the Tanakh. The Talmud came much later and there's two entirely different Talmuds. Well, I wouldn't say entirely, but written in two different places. There's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud rich, written much later. Uh, Rabbi, mm -hmm. everyone refers to the Babylonian Talmud. Is the Jerusalem Talmud used anywhere? <laughs> You're all getting so smart. I'm really, I'm so excited. Like, wow. I feel like we should have like a cigar or something. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's used in Jerusalem, you know, but, but it's true. The Babylonian Talmud gets more play um, and is often the kind of um, deciding voice. Um, and I, I, I don't know enough to say like what parts are used where or by who. Uh, I, the one thing I do know is that the Jerusalem Talmud is, um, there are some leniencies um, that are not in the Babylonian Talmud. So occasionally those will be looked to and, and kind of leveraged um, against the Babylonian Talmud. But I, th I think because the Babylonian Talmud is more, I don't know why it gets the upper hand, to be totally honest. It's a good question. Maybe find out and, or I'll, and I'll ask too and see what we, what we learn. Um, I see we have six more minutes. I just want to check and see. Um, so what's, what is on these following pages, and I'll just give you kind of a, like a little overview. It's pretty cool. They kind of zoom out um, a little bit. So um, this is that first paragraph that's in the mezuzah. Um, this is an additional paragraph that's in our tefillin of kind of reward and consequence. Um, which is the following verses in Deuteronomy. Um, and these are basically the, um, the Shema is often said to have three paragraphs. Um, this is paragraph one, these six words. Paragraph two is um, what's called um, Oops, the Havta, which is this paragraph about love and mezuzot and tefillin. And this is the kind of reward and consequence paragraph. And it's often referred to as the first three words, Bahayam Shema, like if you do this, then that. Um, and it also has in it, um, and don't forget your post it note. Uh, inscribe them on your doorposts so that you'll live, right? So there's a lot of um, do this so that. This is my nephew's uh, in his Torah portion. So we've been talking a lot about this paragraph. And this is a picture of what I, sh what I showed you. It's, this one is a little bit more kind of wavy, which is, interesting to see. I think it's actually like kind of a, it's not laying flat. So it's a little bizarre to look at, I find, but um, that's another image. And then what's following here on these next couple pages are other blessings that are said coming and going. 
other blessings that are said coming and going. So this is the example of a rabbi who, when he would come to work, basically, when he would come to the study hall, he would say a blessing. And when he would leave, he would say a blessing. It's one of my all-time favorites. Um, you know, of really the humility of what it means to be a teacher. <sighs> I think about that a lot as I pull into the shul, <laughs> kind of my own practice. Um, this is what's called the traveler's prayer, which is again, kind of the thinking of the world as our house and how we move from place to place. Are you saying that these are, are additional prayers when people touch the mezuzah or these are their intentions when they touch their mezuzah? Great mezuzah. question. Yeah. So we're kind of, we're out of the mezuzah world. Um, and that ended uh, Yeah, what's in the mezuzah? Let me just go back to the image. Um, let me stop this. What's in the mezuzah is is um, these three paragraphs: the Shema, the Vehavta, and the reward and consequence. That's all that's in a mezuzah. That's all that'll fit. <laughs> these other um, these other texts, and it is a little confusing how they kind of put everything in here, but I think the goal is just to say, um, how, what do they call it? Some potential blessings text for, I find this title actually pretty misleading because it's not like you can, I mean, in some way, and you can make your own mezuzah, which is where they're kind of leading um there's a graphic here write your own scroll of kind of and and so what they're doing here in these um from the traveler's prayer down is giving other ideas of how is it that we come and go does that make sense kind of fodder for how do we think about our comings and our goings because the mezuzah isn't the only blessing or ritual that we do for coming and going. There's the traveler's prayer. Um, there's this prayer that was said upon leaving the house of study. Um, and then this last page of the handout is um, the, the how-to of how to put up a mezuzah. Yeah, I'm going to pause here. I see we have, oh, we're right at 830, but yeah, Philip, we'll just take maybe a couple I, I, comments. I just wanted to, to ask a sort of silly question about the way it's rolled. The Torah when, mm -hmm. in the temple is rolled vertically, mm -hmm. uh, but the little picture about roll, uh, roll your own, or, sorry, uh, uh, do, do it yourself. Uh, mezuzah has a, it looks like it's rolled horizontally. How it, how is it usually if you buy a mezuzah? Are, the cloth, is it, right? Ah, uh, gosh. Well, the way I can't, it's not like coming to my mind, but the way you know is because on the back, there are, there's a three letter word that should be peeking out. And I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure you do roll it top to bottom. Mm. Yeah. Actually, bottom to top. I'd have to, I, you know, it's one of those um, visceral things I'd, I'd need, I would like, but yes, it is absolutely rolled either bottom to top or top to bottom. Um, and then the little um, word on the back side faces out so again there's so much specificity and even the rolling but i think it's a cool question philip it makes me think about you know that we do roll the torah from from end to end so i i'll be real quick it also makes me care do we ever see uh, i'm particularly fond of uh, fond of proverbs and psalms do we ever see that rolled up 
-hmm. and red or it, yeah yeah i mean there are um if you, especially at the jewish museum you can find you know scrolls were the only game in town so everything was a scroll um so well, yeah, I, mean, yes. I meant really in contemporary usage um not for the things that you still find in the scroll are the Megillah, mm. Megillah Esther. Um, and that's kind of it. But it's a cool, I like, I like what you're, where you're going. It'd be fun to bring back some more scrolls in our world. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I want to honor your time and, and just uh, acknowledge you all for for being here. I'm so grateful. And we'll see you next next week for our final shebang. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Thanks, Thanks very much. Everybody. Thank you. Bye, Leto. Oh. Good night. Bye, Leto.